Uh, my name is Heather McConnell, and I'm the Associate Director for Guideline Implementation and Knowledge Transfer at the RNAO. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Uh, we will be recording uh, this information session so that we can utilize it for others who may not have been able to join us today, but absolutely delighted uh, with your interest in the BPSO program and your uh, commitment to joining us here today. Um, I have with me Andrea Stubbs, who's the project lead for our Best Practice Spotlight Organization and our Champions Network. So thank you, Andrea, for being here with us. And I also have Terry Holland here with me from Quinty Healthcare, who I'll introduce um, very shortly um, as she shares with us her experience of being a BPSO lead. So the presentation objectives today are really to gain a better understanding of the BPSO designation program and what's it all about, including eligibility requirements for those interested in applying, uh, looking at the pre-designation deliverables that are expected as part of the program. We'll talk a little bit about the application process and the related timelines. Um, we'll share with some of you, uh, with you some of the supports that are available and provided by RNAO. And obviously we're hoping to have some time for questions and discussion um, towards the end of the presentation today. We'll be together uh, for an hour. But just to kind of uh, set the tone for all of this, and just to remind those of you who may not be familiar, that the uh, Registered Nurses Association of Ontario is the professional association for registered nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, and nursing students in Ontario. And um, we're really seen as the strong, credible voice that leads the nursing profession to influence and promote healthy public policy and clinical excellence. So we have two really uh, pillars of our work. One is public health, uh, is healthy public policy, and the other is clinical excellence. And the best practice guidelines program is really focused on that clinical excellence pillar and is seen as a signature program of the RNAO. Now, and the program mandate um, is really to develop, disseminate, and actively support the uptake and sustainability of evidence-based clinical and healthy work environment best practice guidelines and to evaluate their impact, not only on the client, those that receive the recipients of care, residents, clients, patients, but also organizational and health system outcomes. And we've been extremely fortunate to have been funded um, by the government of Ontario to do this work since uh, 1999. Now, this is a framework that we utilize to guide the work of the International Affairs and Best Practice Guidelines Centre, where the BPG program is situated. And um, you'll see from these three, four circles that uh, there's a focus on guideline development is one of the pillars of our, of our project program. Um, implementation, dissemination and sustainability to the bottom left. Evaluation and monitoring is a critical element of all of this work to see what difference is this making and the impact it's having on patient client, residence, provider, organization, and system outcomes. So today, we're going to be really focusing on uh, the, um, this pillar, the circle to your bottom left, which is focusing on dissemination, implementation, and sustainability. And this is where the Best Practice Spotlight Organization program is situated. And many of the implementation strategies at the individual level that you'll see listed on this um, graphic are really integrated into uh, the BPSO program to help with the uptake of evidence-based practices. So here, again, is another way of looking at um, our implementation methodology. Thinking at the individual level, we have our Champions Network, Advanced Clinical Practice Fellowship Program, and opportunities for professional development and capacity building. At the organizational level, our Best Practice Spotlight Organization Designation Program is the key key strategy for us in terms of supporting the uptake at the organizational level. And then, of course, BPG order sets. And at the systems level, we have many, many um, implementation projects that are funded to really address the uptake of guidelines at the systems level. And an example of that is our long-term care best practices program, our mental health and addictions program, and past work that we've done in the area of um, tobacco cessation and smoking cessation particularly. But today we're here to talk about organizational implementation and the um, best practice spotlight organization program. And the goal of this program is to influence the uptake of best practice guidelines across all healthcare organizations to enable practice excellence and positive client resident outcomes. And I should say all healthcare organizations, but also academic entities. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, during our time together today. 
So what's this all about? Well, organizations who join the Best Practice Spotlight Organization program partner with RNAO to implement a minimum of five clinical guidelines over a three year period in order to attain designation as a Best Practice Spotlight Organization. And this requires an application program process and a formal partnership with RNAO. So the release of the RFP is the first step in that application process. And of course, those that are successful in their submissions um, will actually enter into formal partnership with us through, um, through a contract of terms and conditions. Um, within this program, there are specific requirements for systematic guideline implementation, the establishment of an infrastructure, regular reporting, capacity building, opportunities for dissemination, sustaining pl sustainability planning right from the beginning, and then of course, measuring outcomes through standard indicators. And as a designated BPSO, there are expectations related to expansion, spread, as well as the sustained use of guidelines that have previously been implemented, um, mentoring opportunities to support the, um, the experiences of new BPSOs, and again, continuing to measure um, the outcomes of the implementation process. So we'll speak to some of these more specifically when we get to the section um, on the specific deliverables that are part of the BPSO program. But just to share with you the distribution of BPSOs in Ontario, we have 116 um, organizations uh, that represent 450 healthcare and academic sites across the province of Ontario who are currently involved in the program. And this includes um, academic sites, schools of nursing, um, primary care, home health care, public health, acute care, um, quite a range in terms of home health care, etc., as well as obviously long term care. And we have a specific RFP currently released as well for those organizations that are in the long term care sector who are interested in joining the BPSO program. So this session today is really focusing on the RFP that is for sectors other than long term care and tomorrow. We're going to be having an information session uh, focusing on the RFP that has been released for long term care, but you can see the distribution um, across the province. Having said that, um, we also have distribution of BPSOs that are engaged in this program across the globe. And so we actually have well over a thousand BPSO sites, academic and healthcare sites worldwide. And you can see the distribution of those sites on this um, particular um, image of the globe. It's really quite exciting to see uh, the expansion of this program and actually, believe it or not, during this time of COVID, we've had four applications um, from international sites to join the BPSO program from uh, China, uh, Turks and Caicos and Chile. So the program continues to grow um, and these organizations that are outside of Ontario are really solely funded by their own um, resources and uh, we help provide them with the support that they need to be successful. Uh, the objectives of the program are, are pretty straightforward. There's four of them, um, but probably more if we really talk and think about what are we actually achieving with this program. But basically, we want to establish long term partnerships with organizations that focus on making a difference in client care. Um, with a focus on evidence based practice. We want to learn more about creative strategies for, for successfully implementing best practice guidelines. Um, we also want to talk about and learn more about effective and consistent approaches to evaluating implementation. And that's critically important to know what difference all of this work is making. And being able to identify effective strategies for system wide dissemination of guideline implementation and the impact on outcomes. So, how do we share the successes of our BPSOs? Um, with the broader healthcare community. So at this point, we have released a request for proposals for the pre-designate period from 2021 uh, to believe it or not, 2024. And this current request for proposal, which I hope you have all seen on our website, is exclusive to Ontario House Service and Academic Entities, um, and it will support a new cohort of BPSOs, cohort seven. And those successful applicants will initially enter into a formal agreement with RNAO um, from 2021 to 2024, and we will renew that agreement on an annual basis for those th that three year period. So I'm going to speak now about the eligibility criteria, and I'll try to speak to this briefly because I do want to make sure we have adequate time uh, for Terry to share with us her experience of being the BPSO lead within her organization. But if you're thinking, are we eligible? Is this right for us? Are we ready? Uh, these are the kinds of things and criteria that you might want to be thinking about. 
So we are looking for organizations that have demonstrated a commitment to evidence-based practice, and this could be through the implementation of um, RNAO's best practice guidelines in the past. It might include other um, supports and approaches to evidence-based practice, but truly a commitment to utilizing evidence to inform the practice of staff and the supports for patients and clients. We're also looking for organizations that have supported staff to participate um, in capacity development opportunities related specifically to evidence-based practice. So again, organizations that are investing in their staff to help support them in gaining the knowledge and skills necessary to support evidence-based practice. We're looking for organizations that have strong and explicit support from key stakeholders. So you'll see in the RFP that there is a very specific requirement and letters of support from very key people uh, within the organization and external to it. And we have found over time that having that ex explicit support from the very beginning is critical to the success of um, our BPSOs. Um, we're also looking for organizations that truly have a vision or a mission or a mandate that provides an opportunity to leverage quality improvement initiatives. So, you know, as you're looking at the organizational vision statement or mission statement, you know, does it talk about quality care? Does it talk about quality improvement? Does it talk about evidence-based practice? Does it speak to patient and family-centered care? Those are the kinds of things that we're looking for to ensure that you've got the support from the direction and the mission of your organization to leverage uh, your BPSO work. Um, so these are some other additional criteria that you'll need to consider. Do you have the capacity to implement, monitor, and evaluate nursing best practice guidelines? Do you have the staffing in place? Do you have the resources available? Um, do you have the skill sets available and, and um, able to leverage those to um, be successful in this work? Um, we're also looking and expecting that BPSOs will identify a lead uh, to take um, the lead on this work and uh, that will be dependent on the size of your organization and the scope of your work <clears throat> the amount of time that that individual would need to commit, but certainly we're suggesting a 0.5 to a full-time equivalent individual to help support that. Um, we're also looking for organizations that have demonstrated ability to gauge in su successful partnerships. The BPSO program is a network of organizations that contribute to each other's learning, uh, to, to each other's successes, and support each other. And so we're really looking uh, to engage with organizations who have been able to work with other partners uh, on, on projects of various different scales um, where they've been able to um, support quality outcomes for not only their own clients, but those of others. And then of course, um, we're, we're wanting individual organizations to really identify that they've got the capacity and commitment to not only meet the requirements uh, during the pre-designate period, but also following uh, the time that they are designated after a three-year uh, period, assuming that all of the deliverables have been met. So those are the types of things that, if you're thinking, are we ready? Are we ready for this? Are we ready to be in the spotlight? These are the types of um, eligibility criteria that we're looking for um, to ensure that you'll have good success um, as you move forward with the program. So at this time, I'm going to turn things over to Terry Holland. And Terry is... Um, a member of the professional practice department at Quinty Healthcare. And she lives in Prince, beautiful Prince Edward County, which I'm sure is absolutely glorious at this time of year. And, and Quinty Healthcare uh, consists of four hospitals in southeastern Ontario. And so um, as part of the work of, um, of uh, Quinty Healthcare, they have moved into the, into the role of a BPSO pre-designate. Uh, Terry's background has been in clinical nursing in the acute care environment and prior to her current role as a practice coordinator. Um, she also has a keen interest and extensive experience in nursing regulation. And so Terry has been the BPSO lead um, with uh, Quinty Healthcare since they started their work in 2018. And we're actually absolutely thrilled that she's here with us uh, to share with us her experience um, and the experience of Quinty Healthcare um, in the BPSO program. So Terry, I'm going to turn it over to you. And we'll just need to make sure that you take yourself off mute so we can hear you and that everything's okay before we move ahead. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Heather. Um, I'm happy to be here to speak with everyone about um, our experience as a BPSO at Quinny Healthcare. And control the slides. Um, yeah, so Quinny Healthcare is. Um, 
is uh, located in southeastern Ontario. We have four sites, uh, three rural hospitals that are located in Bancroft, Picton and Trenton, and the larger community hospital that's located in Balbo. I have um, took on the lead uh, when we started our journey in uh, the spring of April uh, 2018. Um, I really had no knowledge of the BPSO program prior to us um, launching the program here. I took on the role uh, with some trepidation, unsure what I was getting myself into, but I'm really excited to say that it has been an amazing learning experience and I have seen how our teams here have grown and developed. We are in the third and the final year of our BPSO uh, pre-designation period now. I cannot believe it's gone as quickly as it has. <laughs> And we are currently implementing and monitoring seven best practice guidelines. Being a multi-site organization has posed some distinct opportunities for us. We attempt to standardize care and processes across the four sites as much as possible. And we've approached BPSO using a system-wide dissemination method. However, at the same time, we have to respect the different cultures at each site and the different resources that are available at each site. We have approximately 240 inpatient beds altogether for most all uh, um, service programs. We have emergency services at um, each of the four hospitals, operating rooms at three hospitals and a number of ambulatory clinics and a range of diagnostic services. There are just over 1700 people that work here at Queenie Healthcare. Approximately 750 of those are nurses, RNs and RPNs, uh, 56 PSWs, uh, 300 or so other healthcare professionals, and um, upwards to 400 um, physicians, midwives, and nurse practitioners. And our inpatient units all utilize, for the most part, a, um, a team-based team model as part of an interprofessional care team. There were many reasons why we chose to become a BPSO pre-designate. Uh, we were up to our knees uh, preparing for accreditation at the time. And so much great work was, was already taking place. It just made sense for us to, to uh, look at BPSO. At the same time, we really wanted to convey the knowledge base that is um, part of nursing and to promote the transfer of evidence-based uh, practice um, into our, our care um, each and every day. We have implemented um, the guidelines at the unit and organizational level with the aim to really promote the development of that evidence-based culture to improve patient care and to really enrich the professional practice of our nurses and our interprofessional teams with an end goal to optimize and improve clinical care and um, organizational outcomes as well. We chose to implement seven guidelines altogether uh, these included the pressure injuries prevention and management guideline, pain management, suicidal ideation, seamless care transitions, patient and family centered care, falls prevention, and our healthy workplace guideline was the preventing workplace violence. Implementing the guidelines really gave us a chance to, to look at and review um, reduce the variation in care, particularly across the four sites, assist with clinical decision-making, identify gaps in practice, and certainly the, the tools that the RNEO provided um, in their toolkit um, assisted us to do so. Um, and to really look and um, ask why we're still, you, still, still doing interventions that really had little effect, um, otherwise known to some of us as sacred cows. This slide um, demonstrates how we were able to align with other activities that were taking place here at Quinney Healthcare, as well as the organization's vision and mission. The lighthouse in the center of the slide is an illustration of our strategic direction. BPSO aligned very closely with our values and our commitment to provide exceptional and compassionate care at Quinney Healthcare. Uh, grassroots Transformation is our process improvement team that was relatively new when we embarked on our BPSO journey. 
uh, there's not a lot of people that work in their department, but they're, um, they are real leaders. They welcomed us into their program and we were able to tap into the knowledge and expertise of that team in terms of process improvement. The grassroots team facilitated an organizational huddle each Wednesday morning. Um, and at that huddle uh, was the CEO very often, uh, certainly a member of senior leadership, managers of which were clinical and non-clinical, and as many frontline staff as, as we could get there. Um, some of those were, were patient care leads. Some of them were even uh, uh, nurses or others that were on modified work. We, we enveloped them into um, grassroots, got them involved, and were able to, they were able to see the really great things that were going on. Being part of that huddle, um, we were able to talk about BPSO on a weekly basis, um, track our implementation progress and to share that with everyone. And it allowed us also to reach out to managers and senior leadership for support where we might be having difficulties or delays, um, where we might have had barriers or where we were unable to move our metrics. With COVID, of course, things have changed for everybody. Um, we are no longer gathering at that grassroots huddle board, but we've moved to Zoom meetings on a weekly basis. Uh, BPSO has been added to safety huddles. I'll talk to a little bit more about that later um, that are taking place on each unit. Um, the BPSO team started out meeting separately, but after a couple of years in, we've realized how so much of the work that we were doing aligned with um, the quality improvement teams that were um, that take place on um, most of the units. Most often the, the issues and the discussions were, were discussed at uh, both tables. And so we reduced the meeting times by collaborating with those other groups to work together in accomplishing our goals. So more times than not now, um, those, those separate teams have merged. And finally, um, several of the guidelines were ROPs. And like I said, we were working on accreditation at the time and we were able to share our resources and our tools and our supports and our reports as we uh, prepared for accreditation. On that note, being a BPSO pre-designate was seen very positively by the accreditors. In the end, we were granted accreditation with exemplary standing, which is something that we were very, really proud of. I'm sharing this next slide. Um, uh, as a graphic to show the um, reporting structure that we uh, developed when we um, first launched BPSO. And I would say this um, evolved um, over the first few months, but um, in the end, um, it really came together and we had a good strong structure in place. Um, this was a model that we adopted from another BPSO hospital. That's a really great thing about being a, pre, uh, a BPSO pre-designate there's a great deal of support for you on your journey. You are never alone. We definitely benefited from the expertise and the experience of our mentor hospital, um, the support of our RNAO mentor. Shout out to Susan McNeil, who has been amazing. Um, we still talk on a regular basis and she's always there to, to help. And other organizations who have also been really willing to share their experiences and their tools. Our BPSO task force, you'll see along the, those are the purple boxes around, uh, along the bottom of that page. Um, that task force uh, was made up of the leads for the seven BPGs. We met on a weekly basis and since last fall, we, we've been meeting bi-weekly. It is a very team-based approach led by the professional practices department. We have several committees that we collaborate with on a regular basis and my director provides a regular report on our progress to the chief nursing officer and to the leadership committee and the chief nurse then reports up to the board. Being a multi-site organization has made it a little more challenging in terms of connecting with staff at all four hospitals, but the leads make it a special point to, to get to those, um, those uh, primary sites on a regular basis. We've used innovative strategies to engage with staff. That's included um, shared education sessions, occasional meetings at one of the primary sites, and we're working with our communications department to share information and updates um, both internally and externally. 
Um, the BPG implementations have also provided uh, additional opportunities to standardize care practices, including documentation across the four sites. On a fun note, we've also found there to be somewhat of a competitive culture <laughs> amongst the sites. Um, when they see their metrics compared to um, some of the other sites, they're spurred on and to improve and they really, um, that competitive nature comes out and they really wanna be on top. So that's been great um, to improve our outcomes and um, a lot of fun at the same time. Um, we took a hiatus from BPSO for approximately the first four months of COVID. I think anybody would understand that. Um, but we've since returned um, to our bi-weekly meetings and are conducting team meetings virtually and in person um, as able. Um, yeah, so we are really proud of how we've grown and prospered. We report on our metrics for three uh, clinical best practice guidelines in the Enquire system. You'll learn a lot more about that. It's very easy and intuitive system. Um, and we also report on two structural indicators, which are, I guess, probably human resource related. We further measure indicators for each of the other guidelines and report them um, with the help of our decision support analytics department. Uh, each of those metrics are monitored weekly by our own team. Some of the reports are shared regularly with the unit managers and they um, further go on to share those, those reports with their, um, with their units. I would say one big benefit that we've seen um, to our team in professional practice and those that would be leading um, BPSO have, uh, is really that we have built skills and knowledge and expertise around using Excel. Um, we create and format our own our charts now. We've really come to, to better understand if you can't improve what you can't measure and have um, really gained in depth knowledge as, in, as to how healthcare analytics uh, improves patient care. Our leads understand the, the crucial importance of having frontline nurses and other team members on the team in order to fully understand what's happening on the units. We've also seen that having the interest and the engagement of senior leadership at our grassroots huddle has really strengthened the program and our messaging. And I really can't emphasize that enough. Our champions have a number of different roles and perform a, a uh, different important functions depending on their ability to do so and really I guess what their their roles within their on their units are. Um, they participate in meetings, uh, engage with patient advisors, some of them do research and create surveys and audits. It's really been an opportunity for them for them to blossom. Uh, frontline champions bring a unit perspective to the conversation. Information and thoughts that we may make assumptions about, but otherwise we don't really know. Um, we don't live it each and every day. Also where we've had patient experience partners on the teams and we've had them for several of them, um, that perspective has been really profound and has been welcomed with um, open arms and um, had a really um, profound effect on, on nurses when they've actually come to trust and understand and hear the patient perspective. Uh, we've learned a great deal about program management and the ability to plan systematically, again, using the tools from the toolkit, engaging with stakeholders, project planning and establishing and trying to keep to timelines. Um, using the advice uh, from the RNAO, we definitely started out with baby steps and looked for easy wins to start with. And this is all advice and support that you will get from the association um, if you uh, go down this journey. Um, in terms of um, clinical improvements, we've just, we've had um, a number of them. Aside from our metrics and our reports that we share with the units on a regular basis, we have looked at new documentation screens that are now more intuitive and easier to navigate. Um, we've developed new uh, resources for our staff and also for our patients. Um, we've uh, developed new audit tools. Um, we've actually also been able to engage with nurses that are on modified duties. We've, um, we've brought them into BPSO and um, uh, used them to help with some of our, um, with our strategies and some of our resources, et cetera. 
and which in turn has really also under, enhanced their understanding and, and their knowledge of evidence-based practices. And the great thing is, is they're gonna take that back with them to their everyday care, to their conversations on the unit with their colleagues. Uh, we've fulfilled significant improvements in the um, care transitions guideline. Um, of interesting note, um, our grassroots team actually launched a failure mode and effects analysis, an FMEA, um, focused on identifying and prioritizing the risks that are associated with patient transfers. And being a multi-site organization, we've, we've experienced a number of um, issues with, with patient transfers in our, in our um, experience. We found the recommendations that came out of that analysis, the FMEA, aligned directly with the recommendations in the care transitions guideline and there were a number of improvements that we've implemented to support safe patient transfer between the sites. And we're now starting to look at uh, sustainability and how to integrate processes now that will support um, the um, ongoing um, uh, best practices that have come out of the guidelines. Um, we're working hard at keeping the conversation alive and the champions engaged um, BPSO is a standing item at um, several of our committees in the organization. So just finishing up, um, in healthcare, we really, we really don't take the time to stop uh, and take a deep breath and, and recognize what we've accomplished. So often we're reactive. It's easy to get bogged down in the whirlwind of daily work, but one thing that BPSO has taught us is really how important it is for us to stop, take stock and celebrate what we've accomplished. Um, we've had a number of um, celebratory events um, in which we were um, able to highlight BPSO. We had a Champions Open House, again, supported by the uh, RNAO. Um, we've had BPSO cakes during our annual um, hospital recognition days. We talk about BPSO at Nursing Week. Uh, we've had some roadshow events where a few of us have gone out and done a little song and dance about BPSO, trying to get people excited about it. Um, we've had, we talk about BPSO at job fairs and our skills fair and um, through social media. And it's really, um, it's been really important for us to, to make this fun at the same time and to celebrate um, the good stuff that's that's been going on. Doing uh, BPSO does not have to mean additional work. It's really an opportunity to highlight the great work that you have currently underway, to involve the frontline and engage them in process improvement and integrating evidence-based practice into data care. And it's a chance to collaborate with your teams and share in improving care at your organization. So I thank you today, and I thank the RNEO also for the opportunity to talk about our experience at CUNY Healthcare, and I hope it's been helpful to you um, as well as you consider the, uh, this exciting program. So um, I'm also, um, I'll share my email uh, uh, with RNEO, and I also would invite anybody to uh, contact me anytime if you have any questions. Thank you. Harry, thank you so very much for sharing your experiences um, with the BPSO. And um, many of the things that you've spoken about will fit just beautifully with um, what I'm going to speak to now, which is about BPSO deliverables. So thanks for setting the stage so beautifully for that. Um, so I'm going to start with talking about the requirements. And, and um, these are all laid out in the RFP in as much detail as we were able to provide. And, I'm hoping that having the opportunity to speak to them now will help clarify um, what the requirements are uh, if you have questions, but certainly by all means don't hesitate to jot any questions in the chat and we'll try to address them as best we can uh, before the end of the session today. So um, basically at minimum, organizations that enter into the BPSO program are committing to engaging in a three-year partnership with RNAO um, and that partnership is renewed annually uh, reviewed and renewed annually, provided that the criteria are met. So on an annual basis, we meet to discuss progress. And at that point, we renew the contract for the next year uh, for those first three years. And it's really um, necessary that organizations are in a position to contribute the necessary human and financial resources to support the initiative. Um, 
and we you will note that in the RFP there is a budget requirement that outlines uh, what you're able to contribute to the BPSO work um, over the three year pre designation period. So we talk about systematic implementation and Terry certainly spoke to systematic implementation in her presentation. And so um, I'm going to speak over the course of the rest of the time we have together uh, to these uh, different elements of systematic implementation that you see uh, down the, the, the right hand side of the slide. And all of these are elements within um, the RFP uh, that we discuss and mention. And the first one being the implementation toolkit. So Terry did speak about the tools and resources that we provide and I'd be interested to know that we're actually in the process of uh, making a significant revision to our implementation toolkit. Uh, that is based on the, on the knowledge to action framework. Um, Susan McNeil's on the call with us today and she's leading that work along with um, Catherine Wallace, who I believe is also on the call with us today. And we're very, very excited about that because we're learning much, much about um, not only implementation through the KTA model, but also social movement action. And so our new toolkit will have a big focus on that. So I'm not going to speak a lot about that today. What I'm really wanting to talk about are the requirements for BPSO. So implementation is obviously the critical foundation for all of this work. And um, you'll see from the RFP uh, that there's a requirement to implement a minimum of five uh, clinical practice guidelines. Um, now, Terry spoke about implementing seven, and yes, they implemented, they're working on the implementation of seven guidelines, but five is the minimum required. Now, two of these must be implemented across the entire organization. Um, if you're an academic organization, school of nursing, it would need to be across the entire curriculum. And the remaining guidelines may be implemented within a specific unit or program, um, et cetera. So it's really up to you to determine, you know, how the scope of the work that you want to do. But two guidelines uh, need to be across the entire organization. And there are two mandatory guidelines uh, that need to be implemented across the entire organization. And these have been chosen to align with the provincial government's health system transformation agenda. And those guidelines are person and family centered care and care transitions. So if you're thinking about um, applying for BPSO in your cycle in cohort seven, uh, these two guidelines are the required guidelines, mandatory guidelines that you need to implement. And these are consistent with other work we're doing in the area of BPSO, OHTs, Ontario health teams, and also in, in long-term care. So those are the first two. Um, which I've spoken to. One additional guideline uh, needs to be chosen from the mandatory list that's provided in Appendix A of the RFP, and I'll share that with you in a moment. And then the remaining two uh, guidelines can be selected from any um, of the uh, RNAO's published clinical guidelines. So it could be the ones that are on the mandatory list or could be others, but they do need to be clinical uh, best practice guidelines, not healthy work environment or system guidelines. So the mandatory list of guidelines are listed here and they're included in the appendix A of the RFP. So two mandatory guidelines, person and family centered care and care transitions. The third mandatory guideline organizations can select from these lists depending on their sector. And then two additional guidelines that are really up to the organization based on their needs um, related to any um, service needs that they have for their particular patient population. So I hope that's clear. That's a big significant change this time around that there are two mandatory guidelines, person and family centered care and care transitions. Now, in order to be successful and having learned a lot working with uh, six cohorts of BPSOs and an equal number in long-term care, um, implementation of three guidelines need to be initiated in year one. And the remaining two guidelines uh, can be initiated in year one or two um, based on the needs of the organization and what makes most sense for you. However, all five of the guidelines should be uh, completed in terms of the planned implementation activities by the end of year two. And that really allows year three to do any final, um, final um, activities that are necessary, but really focusing on integration, sustainability, and evaluation. If we find a people, organizations leave the implementation until year three, they start to run out of time to be really successful in their integration of the, of the um, implementation activities and the changes they're making to practice. So um, this is the uh, outlined in the RFP again, and um, hopefully that that's understandable that basically by the end of year two, so that would be by the end of uh, March 2023, all of the five guidelines would need to be implemented. 
you know, there are other deliverables related to capacity building. And so one of them is champions, and Terry spoke about the use of their champions in a variety of different ways. Um, but there is a requirement that you need to be able to commit to uh, engaging a critical mass of staff as the RNAO best practice champions. Uh, that involves attending champions workshops, which currently are all virtual. Um, but also we have an online e-learning and hopefully in the future we'll be able to resume in-person uh, champions workshops. So more about the champions work uh, network is available on our website. And I know that many of you have already started to um, develop a staff as uh, best practice champions. And they're going to be really critical to the implementation process over the pre-designation period and beyond. Other capacity building uh, deliverables that are required are attendance at the Clinical Best Practice Guideline Institute. This is an annual event that we host. Um, but, and actually we're in year 17, I think this year. Uh, this year will be our first virtual offering, um, but certainly normally it's an in-person event where it's really meant to be an immersive experience to learn more about guideline implementation based on the knowledge to action framework. Obviously, we'll be adding content related to social movement action as the toolkit is revised, um, but really an opportunity to network with others who are interested in similar work and learning from other BPSOs um, related to their guideline implementation experience. So that's included in the RFP. Um, and that is a requirement, depending on the size of your organization, can be annual or um, uh, if you have a, a smaller number of staff, uh, you may only have to send one or two people over the three year period. It's very dependent on the size of your organization. Um, in terms of capacity building, there are other requirements. And one is a participation or at least the um, application submission for uh, the Advanced Clinical Practice Fellowship. So some of you may or may not be as familiar with this particular program. It does, it is separate from um, the BPSO initiative, um, and there are funds available to help support a number of um, individuals to participate in learning experiences annually. And these are funded at actually $15,000 per fellowship. And so there is a requirement that BPSOs in that pre designate period have a registered nurse uh, submit a proposal for participation in the Advanced Clinical Practice Fellowship Program. And because the intention is to build capacity and guideline implementation, uh, the fellowship really should focus in some way on the, um, the guidelines that have been selected for implementation um, for your BPSO work. There's quite a wide breadth of flexibility uh, available within the Advanced Clinical Practice Fellowship Program. And again, there's information on our website related to that. We'll be releasing an RFP uh, for this program in early November, and we'll be having information sessions um, virtually in November for it as well. So if you don't know an awful lot about it, kind of wondering what it's all about, um, that may be a great opportunity for you to learn more. Implementation deliverables that link to um, some of the structural pieces that are involved in this work is being involved with having a BPSO lead. So I mentioned that at the beginning, and uh, Terry is the BPSO lead uh, for Quinty um, Healthcare, and each one of our BPSO has a designated individual who is the lead, who's coordinating the implementation and evaluation activities, and really helping to support and guide uh, the implementation teams. Um, they don't do this alone. They have teams available to help support them. And you can see from Terry's um, chart that she shared with us, the structure that they put in place to help support the implementation. And that could include a steering committee and should include some kind of a committee, whether you call it a BPSO steering committee. Uh, Terry spoke about the fact they started with a separate committee and then it kind of merged with their quality committee. And that's absolutely fine. And actually something that we see a lot with BPSOs as they mature in their experience. Um, and of course, we will provide um, a coach uh, to each of our BPSOs that can help support you one on one with um, your implementation activities. So you'll get to know an RNAO staff member very well uh, who's able to provide you with that coaching experience. We have regular knowledge exchange meetings, and these are webinars uh, that we host on a regular basis, a bit more frequently at the beginning and a little less frequently um, towards the end of the three year period, has been our most recent experience. But really, these are intended to build a network of colleagues um, that you can reach out to to get more information. And again, Terry spoke about being able to utilize um, some of the tools from other BPSOs that um, 
had, were willing to share their information. And so this is capacity building at its best where um, organizations involved in BPSO are really very generous with their um, skills, knowledge, and the work that they've developed to help support others within their cohort and beyond. We do uh, look to matching um, a new BPSO with an experienced BPSO so that they can act in a mentorship role for the new site. Um, and certainly um, that's something that we, we uh, work hard at to ensure that there's a good match from the beginning. And, and organizations use their mentors in different ways. So it's really up to the two sites how best that works for you. But just so that you know, you not only have a coach from the RAO, but you would have a mentor organization from our, our growing uh, list of existing BPSOs. Annually, RNEO hosts a BPSO Knowledge Exchange Symposium, and generally this is in person where we have, last time we met in 2019, we had well over 200 participants from both our pre-designate and designate organizations from Ontario, other parts of Canada, um, and some international guests uh, from our BPSOs um, in other parts of the world. And these are extremely exciting events where we all get very motivated and learn new ideas about guideline implementation and sustainability. And, and this year, um, we'll be offering this, um, we'll be hosting this particular event uh, towards the end of November, and it will be virtual this year, but we're looking very much forward to gathering together with all of our BPSOs for that um, knowledge exchange opportunity. So when you're looking at the RFP, you'll see a large number of deliverables related to capacity building, and which I've spoken to now then, the, the engagement of champions and the recruitment and training of champions, participation in the Advanced Clinical Practice Fellowship Program, involvement and participation in the Clinical Institute, um, being involved and contributing to knowledge exchange meetings, and then having that opportunity for, for mentorship. Another one of the key deliverables is monitoring and evaluation, and there is a requirement for mandatory participation in the international data system called Enquire. We call it Enquire, and it stands for Nursing Quality Indicators for Reporting and Evaluation. And, and Terry spoke to the fact that they were submitting um, Enquire uh, indicators for humans or structural indicators, two of them, and they were also um, submitting data related to process and outcome indicators for their clinical guidelines that they've selected. And so again, this um, learning uh, helps with rapid learning for organizations. You're able to see the progress that you're making related to the implementation of the guidelines and the recommendations that you've chosen for implementation. And it also helps build a data system or database of um, um, results and data for us as a, as a system, a health system, to be able to better understand the contribution of nurses and other healthcare providers to the outcomes that patients and organizations um, achieve. Uh, dissemination is a big piece of all of this too, and certainly Terry joining us here today was part of this, uh, this, this work, but we're, we're really looking at opportunities and expecting our BPSOs to present at conferences, um, to talk about um, providing information on their website, so having a BPSO presence on their organizational website. Uh, over the three-year period, there's a requirement to sit and submit a manuscript for publication, uh, whether that's a peer-reviewed or non-peer-reviewed publication, uh, being able to establish a social media presence within the confines of organizational policies, and really utilizing the use of the BPSO logo on any relevant activities, uh, documents, etc., to really highlight the fact that you are participating in this program, um, it's growing around the world, and that you as a BPSO pre-designate um, are proud of the work that you're doing and able to share the outcomes of that work. Uh, sustainability is also uh, something that we look for early on. And so as part of the work that you'll do with implementing guidelines, we'll ask you to start thinking about sustainability. And by the end of year two, you should have a fairly well-established uh, sustainability plan that will be able to help you um, with the uh, maintenance of the work that you've done already, as well as the expansion and spread of beyond that. Now, part of our, our work together is the whole component of reporting. So I've spoken about Enquire and the expectation that each of our BPSOs would um, participate in the, in the Enquire um, submissions, and that is a mandatory component of our program and has a separate contract that deals with 
a data um, usage agreement that deals with data um, security, et cetera. But we meet regularly with our BPSOs to monitor progress. And so twice per year during the pre-designate period, our BPSOs um, submit um, um, an online report that focuses on the deliverables. We call it the My BPSO Report. And it really focuses on not so much the numbers related to the outcomes for specific guidelines, but rather what, what difference is this making for the organization? So we ask about the specific deliverables that I've spoken to already related to capacity building. We talk very directly about practice changes that are happening within the organization, what education's been um, implemented to support practice, and what policies and um, documentation systems, et cetera, that might have been modified or introduced to help ensure sustainability. So we have these written reports that are submitted twice per year. Um, we have report review meetings with myself, um, members of our implementation um, team, our implementation science team, which includes the coach, and then of course the members of the BPSO that they choose to have on those calls. And, and it's a really wonderful time for us to get to actually speak one-on-one -on -one with those sites and get to understand truly uh, the impact that this work is happening. And of course, it's a great opportunity for rapid learning and quality improvement and helps us identify areas where we need to provide additional support. Um, once during the three-year period at minimum, we're looking to do site visits uh, to do an audit to see how things are progressing at those individual organizations to validate the written reports. And again, as I mentioned right at the beginning, that the um, contracts or the partnerships with RNEO are reviewed um, and renewed annually uh, during this pre-designate period. And that's really based on this reporting and monitoring process. So the application process. We have released the RFP and the um, application is an online application. Um, once the letter of intent deadline uh, comes and goes and you've submitted a letter of intent, you will get access to the online submission form and it will be made available to the individual who submitted the letter of intent. Um, and the online submission will follow very closely the requirements that are outlined towards the end of the RFP um, related to the various different aspects of the um, RFP that are being considered. You'll notice that there's details related to the percentage of the weighting of each of the uh, areas of the RFP, et cetera. And within the online form, it'll actually provide you with guidance for the word limits, et cetera. Uh, and this will address all aspects of the RFP requirements that are, are included in the document that you should have available to you at this point in time. So the review process. Um, internally, we will have um, established a BPSO review committee. So once the applications are received, uh, they will be reviewed by a team of those who have experience in uh, this program. And so that will include our BPSO coaches, our implementation science specialists, members of our evaluation team who are experts in terms of helping to identify areas of strength and areas of, um, that may need further development related to monitoring evaluation and data submission. Um, generally, we'll have a, an existing BPSO lead um, from an external organization, external to RNA, I should say, participate on those groups as well. So ideally, each proposal is actually reviewed by four to five different individuals. And we have a well-established scoring matrix that we utilize to evaluate those proposals. And then the successful applicants will be identified based on the review scores. Sometimes we need to reach out to um, the, um, the submitter to get additional information uh, where there may have been some questions that the reviewers had uh, that they wanted further clarification on before moving ahead. But based on that process, then RNAO will inform the applicants in writing of the status of their application um, regardless of whether they've been accepted or not. So in terms of important dates, uh, right now the RFP is live and open and was released last Friday. The letter of intent is due November the 16th. Um, the deadline for the RFP is December the 7th. And so we're hoping to get those in prior to any sort of break for the holiday season. The release of the results will happen in February, um, February the 9th is our target for that. And of course, during the time between the RFP deadline and the release of results, um, those the reviewers will be doing the review process. We'll be following up with any of the sites if there are additional questions or areas of clarification that we require. 
um, and then actually um, making de in internal decisions related to the successful candidates. Our goal will be to have the contract signed by the end of March, and then we would have a launch of some sort, hopefully in person, but if not, uh, we've had experience now in doing virtual launches uh, with our BPSOs, and we would aim to do that in April of 2021. So those are the timelines that we're, we've established at this point, and obviously depending on what happens with um, the, uh, our current COVID situation and um, evolving COVID situation, you know, we can certainly look at needing to modify some of those dates, but certainly at this point in time, that's what we're um, what we're planning for. So at this point, uh, we've got about five minutes left, and I'm going to see if there are any questions in the chat. Um, so somebody's asking, I just started as a manager of clinical programs in a pediatric hospice. Is this type of organization eligible? Um, so first of all, I think absolutely, as long as you're um, an organization that's here within Ontario um, and you're providing services, yes, you would be eligible um, to consider. And again, I think we need to look at, you've talked about a very small staff, uh, which is which is not, um, which is a challenge in some ways and also a benefit in others in terms of uh, engaging the team, being able to communicate um, consistency of practices, etc. We have had some organizations, um, particularly in primary care, that have been really quite small uh, in terms of their team. So that shouldn't preclude. Um, and in terms of the number of human resources, again, it's really dependent on your organization, uh, the scope of the work that you're wanting to do. So I can't say, you know, you need to have um, 10 champions or you need to have 300 champions. It's really dependent on your organization and how you're currently structured. Um, so I would say that I would have a really good look at the RFP, and I think it's Patricia that's asking that question. And certainly, if you, if as you move through the RFP and are looking at the questions, if you've got anything um, specific that you want to just clarify, we'd be happy, happy, happy to um, to further discuss that with you. Um, so the good question, this next one coming up from Mary, um, and she's asking about financial contributions provided by Orn Arneo. And so um, you've actually caught a very good um, change that we've made this time around. We are not um, providing funding, direct funding for BPSOs at this point. Um, and that's really to align uh, the program with our long-term care of BPSOs. We've gone, we're moving to cohort seven of that group and have not provided funding to the long-term care sector. Um, we are not providing funding for our BPSO OHTs, which we've just started working with this past year. And so this will be the first RFP where we will not be providing funding to, um, to organizations that are submitting. However, we are providing supports in the, in the form of coaching supports and services, um, knowledge exchange opportunities, hosting of events that we will fund um, for individuals to attend, et cetera. So that's very definitely true. Um, and that's why it's not in the current proposal. However, the budget that you're to submit would really be the responsibility of the organization exactly. So what, what would you see that you would need to be able to commit to uh, meeting the requirements for the BPSO um, um, pre-designate period, uh, considering the fact, and we've tried to identify in the RFP itself where RNAO will be funding um, certain types of programming, et cetera. So for travel and accommodation, for example, for the, um, the symposium uh, would be at the expense of um, RNAO. Uh, I would definitely say that should the proposal first be approved in the organization we work, I think absolutely that's critical. You are going to need letters of support from the organization in order for you to actually complete the RFP. So I think it's really critical that as you're working through the proposal, um, you're engaging others in the development of the, of the content, making those decisions around which guidelines you're going to implement, and um, you are able to make the determination about what guidelines you'd like to implement beyond those two mandatory ones that I spoke to, person and family-centered care and care transitions. So I hope that answers that question, but I, I really strongly recommend that if you're thinking, I'd like to move ahead with this, that you make sure that the organization is fully supportive of um, their involvement in the program before you uh, go forward, and it would be really important to engage um, members of the teams that will be implement, doing the implementation, 
that they are fully aware um, and supportive of this as well. So when you look at the letters of support that we're needing, you'll see that it includes letters of support from senior leadership, but also clinical staff members as well. Now, having said all that, it is now exactly 3.30. Um, and I don't see any more questions in the chat, but please um, don't hesitate. Now, uh, there's details in the RFP. If you do have subsequent questions that you'd like to explore further, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, and we'd be happy to respond um, in writing to the questions that you may have once you have a maybe a closer look at the RFP or actually start completing um, your submission. Um, but absolutely delighted that you're able to join us today. Uh, we have recorded this um, presentation, and so we will post it on uh, the website once we've had a chance to um, compress it and edit it. Uh, it will be available on the ed on our website along on our RFP page. Um, if you'd like to share it or direct others to it, um, that you want to ensure that they're familiar with what the uh, BPSO program and this opportunity is all about. Of course, this, this up, um, RFP is released every three years, uh, so this is the, the time now for the early part of the the 2020s, if you will, um, to submit and participate in the program. So with that, I'm going to thank you all very, very much for joining us today. Again, thank you so much, Terry, for joining and sharing your experience, uh, Andrea, for um, all of the, the support and getting us ready for this uh, RFP release, and for um, our team, um, our AO team members that are on the call today, and to all of you who have expressed an interest in exploring further uh, the opportunities with BPSO. So I wish you a good afternoon. And we'll look forward to hearing from you in the future. Take care. Bye for now.